continue our worship now through the study of God's Word. We give Him all worth and glory and honor when we open His Word to study in His presence. So grab your Bibles, your devices, turn to Exodus chapter 24. We're going to continue our series through the book of Exodus this morning. We're at to chapter 24. And so we're getting there. We're going to cover the whole chapter this morning. And if you need to, up here on the screen will be other scriptures I'm going to use this morning. So if you want to find those now and, and bookmark them, somehow you're more than welcome to. Uh, we're going to get into that uh, later this morning. But I want you to see that I'm not making it up. And I'm trying not to pull things out of context. And so this is what we're going to be studying here this morning. As a reminder of where, things, where we find ourselves in Exodus 24, the people of God, the Israelites, have been set free from slavery in Egypt. They were there for 430 years generation after generation after generation, slaves in Egypt. And while they've been there, um, God has been working and moving and moving pieces around to bring about their deliverance. And he does so through a man named Moses. Now, Moses, uh, like most characters in the Bible, except for Jesus, is a flawed, broken man who God uses to bring a powerful presence of God into the world. So he delivers the people of Israel, sets them free, and they wander. They're making their way towards what God has called the promised land, the land he's promised to them. It's going to be a while before they get there because a place prepared needs a people prepared, and the people aren't yet prepared for the promised land just yet. And so a couple chapters ago, or a number of chapters ago, we found them at the edge of a mountain called Mount Sinai. And it's here where the rest of the book of Exodus takes place. And at this Mount Sinai, they've been given the Ten Commandments just orally. God's given them the Ten Commandments. He gave them the Book of the Covenant. So he gave them the Ten Commandments. And then he gave them a more code, law code of how to actually live that out. And that was chapters 21 through 23. Then we finished last week uh, with 23 with God saying, I've got this place for you. You're going to have to help me. Let's, let's, get the, let's get the people out of it so it can be your land. And so now what's happened is now there's this moment. Or if you picture kind of a wedding scene, the vows have been read, and now the question is, are you going to do it? Are you going to say, I do, and and mean it? That's kind of where things stand here this morning. I'm going to read through chapter 24 just to give us a frame of reference, give us some context. Then I want to teach through it. And then there's a particular portion in here that just has stuck with me over the past week or week and a half that I just could not get my mind wrapped around until this week. But I think it's where God's taking us here this morning. So let's go. Exodus chapter 24, verse 1. Then he, this is the Lord, said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, to Yahweh, you and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel, and worship from afar or from a distance. Moses alone shall come up to the Lord, but the others shall not come near, and the people shall not come up with them. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and the rules. So now he tells them the book of the covenant. And all the people answered with one voice and said, All the words the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, this is chapters 21 through 23, and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they all said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people, like you do, and said, behold the the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet as it were, of pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and wait there, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up to the mountain of God, and he said to the elders, Wait here for us until we return to you, and behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights." 
Uh, I grew up, um, one of my favorite meals, and even today, is pot roast. Anybody else love a good pot roast? Especially on a Sunday in the fall, a pot roast when you get home. I love it. I love, I love how it smells. I love how it tastes. I don't love the squishy carrots in it. I don't like that part. Uh, give me a raw carrot. I don't, I don't like, the, I got a texture thing, man, I'm telling you. So uh, some of you like that, you can have mine. Um, but I, I, love, I love pot roast. I love the way it smells. My mom, um, I'm the oldest of six. And so my mom learned uh, pretty early on how to cook for a lot of people. And even today, it's just her and my dad. She still cooks for a lot of people, which means her fridge is full of leftovers for weeks and weeks and weeks. But um, I, I love pot roast. And I loved it even as a kid. And so I remember at one point, I think it was late middle school, maybe early high school, a friend invited me over and said, hey, I want to, and you can just stay for dinner. I'm like, that's great. I'll stay for dinner. And so then the question is, well, what are you guys having for dinner? Because I need to know if I'm staying or not, depending on what you're having for dinner. <laughs> and he says, we're having pot roast. And I was like, yeah, then I'm in. I'm, I'm in. 100% I'm in. So I'll go over and we play and we're playing, I don't know, Ninja Turtles on the Nintendo or whatever. And we're playing, uh, playing outside. And then it's time for dinner. But then it hits me like, and I've been here almost all day and I haven't smelled any pot roast cooking. You know what I mean? Like when you make pot roast in the crock pot, your neighborhood smells like pot roast. Like you smell, everyone smells it. Your clothes start to smell like it. You're, some of you are you're hungry right now thinking about how good that smells. Well, it hits me. Gosh, I, I haven't smelled that all day. So I don't know what's happening. So then we, we get ready. We wash our hands. And then I hear the beeping of the microwave. And I'm like, oh, I don't. Okay. And it's just him and his dad. And his dad brings out a plastic tray. He just peeled the plastic right off the top. And he said, pot roast. And I said, I don't think we are on the same page as far as what pot roast is. So it's some brown looking something in the big tray, the big spot. And then there's some um, fluffy white something they call mashed potatoes. And so we sit down to eat. And mama always told me, if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say anything at all. So it was a really quiet meal uh, there together, all of us. His family also made them drink a, a glass of milk every time they had dinner. I don't, I don't like milk in the morning. I'm not going to drink it at night. But I needed something to wash that down. So, man, I chugged that milk as fast as I could. But there's different ways, <clears throat> there's different ways to cook, right? There's different ways to create something. And one of the best ways to cook is just to take your time cooking. Those of you who smoke ribs and brisket, you understand what I'm saying. It takes a while. And it takes a while to even get it on the grill, to get it in the smoker. You got to let it marinate. You got to put it in all the juices. You got whatever you're doing to it. You got to do it. But what you know, and we all know this to be true, the longer it takes something to cook, the better it tastes. It's just better that way. It's just better. TV, dinner, Roast beef is disgusting. It's awful. Crockpot roast beef, I mean, that's the nectar of heaven. That's just, that's amazing what's been given to us. And the difference really is not in the name. The difference is what it took to get there. It's the marinating. It's the sitting in it. It's, it's the smell. It's everything that wafts forward to us. Now, the truth is, for many of us, particularly in our culture that's so consumeristic, we have moved away from quality and moved into quantity. It's why stores that sell things for a dollar are still in business. That's why. Because you can get so many things for $5. It will last you three hours. It's like, it's like uh, fruit stripe gum. It's not going to last you long. But while you have it, gosh, it's good. But that mentality has made its way into the church as well. And so what's happened for us, particularly maybe even more so in the South, is that we become consumeristic, even when it comes to studying the Word of God. We'd rather have quantity over quality, which is why a number of churches, they set their preaching time limit at 20 minutes, which is why I could not work at one of those churches because I'm a solid 45 to hour and a half. And so I'm going to have to sit in it for a little bit. I want you to marinate in it, right? But um, we become so consumeristic in that way. So we're going to read through this passage, and I want you to pay attention to how many times it mentions like the length of time and the time of day and those types of, I want you to pay attention to it because it just jumped out at me as I was studying this passage today. And my hope for us today, that I want, I want to serve a feast from a crock pot today. I don't want to push buttons on a microwave for us today. So let's go into chapter 24 again, verse one. The Lord said to Moses, come up. 
to the Lord, to Yahweh, you, Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu. We talked about this before, and I know you have friends and family members, and they tell you stories about people, like you're supposed to know who those people are. And you're like, I've never met them a day in my life. I'm, I, don't, I don't know who, who you're talking about. Well, we just, this just happened. Adab and Abihu. We have not heard about Nadab and Abihu. We have not heard about them at all. We're 24 chapters in, and then Moses is like, well, now's the time to introduce you, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. I'm just going to share their names. So I'm going to tell you who they are just to help us. Nadab and Abihu are the sons of Aaron. Aaron is the brother of Moses, which makes Nadab and Abihu Moses' nephews. Good? That's important, and that'll come up later in the book of Exodus. Right now it's not as important, but just know that they are with him. And the 70 of the elders of Israel. Remember when Moses um, had too much to do, so he appointed leaders over different portions of the group. This most likely who the elders are. And he calls them, God calls them up. They've been at the base of the mountain and God calls them up to worship him. Verse two, but Moses alone shall come near, shall come all the way into the Lord, but the others shall not come near and the people shall not come up with them. Do you remember why? Because God had called them up earlier and they refused to go up. So God put boundary places around his presence. And so now he's inviting the 70 elders Aaron and his two sons, and they're going to go. But he says only Moses can come all the way in. There's a portion, a place in which the 70 elders and Aaron and his two sons can be. But then I want Moses all the way in. Verse 3, Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules. So then Moses goes through the Ten Commandments, goes back through the Book of the Covenant. So this is the portion of the wedding where the vows have now been read. And the people answered with one voice and said, all the words the Lord has spoken, we will do. They say, I do. That's, that's what's happened there. And then Moses, just to make sure, he writes all the words down. I want to make sure that this isn't lost in translation. He writes down all the words of the Lord. Then he rose early in the morning, like you do. When you're cooking a feast, you rise early in the morning. And he built an altar at the foot of the mountain, the 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. If you remember from the book of the covenant, God told Moses, here's how you build an altar. I want it to be out of stone just from the earth, but don't cut any of the stone. But build me an altar, a place to worship, to sacrifice. So Moses does, and he makes 12 pillars. Now, I don't want you to think like Roman Colosseum pillars. That's not what this is. They're probably just rocks that are stood up on their end to be tall, but it's 12 of them. And so Moses creates this for the 12 tribes of Israel to represent the people is what he makes. Um, verse five. Then he sent young men of the people of Israel. And you ask why young men? Well, we're going to learn here in a second. He sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. Why the young men to go? Because they have to go get oxen and no old man's going to go drag an oxen back up here. So he calls the young men, you young strapping lads, you go get the oxen, kill them and then bring them up here for the offering. So they go and they do. Now notice there's two different types of offerings here. There's a burnt offering and a fellowship or a peace offering. Now, the burnt offering would be they would take the carcass of the animal, they'd take some parts out, but then they would put the animal on the altar and they would do what some of you do when you cook. They would just burn it to a crisp and they would just light it on fire and just forget to set the timer. And that's what they would do. So they, they would burn it all the way to where like it's not edible anymore. No offense, but that's what happens where... Um, you got to just fake it till you make it. So they, they did that until it was burnt all the way to the crisp. Now, what's happening is as it's being burnt, uh, the smoke is making its way up to the Lord. And so the idea there is while the people can't get to God, at least their offering can. So it's making its way up to the heavens. And so that, was, that comes up later in the book of Leviticus. But then we also get the peace. Some of your translations say the fellowship offering. Now in this one, uh, they wouldn't burn the food all the way. They would actually put on the altar and even cook it. And they would take the blood, and we learn about this later. They would take the blood and do some things with it. But it's important to remember, this peace offering is meant to represent fellowship between the people and God. That's representing peace, reconciliation between them. And so to symbolize that, they would place the, um, the meat that had been cooked on the altar, and then they would eat the other half of it. That, that's my kind of offering, man. I like that one. And so they would partake and eat the, the fellowship or peace offering. Um, later on, it would be called a covenant meal is the idea. That's important for us moving forward. Verse 6, And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins, and half of the blood 
he threw against the altar. So now he takes the blood of the oxen and he throws it against the altar. But if you're paying attention, that's just half of it. So they know, well, where's the other half go? I'm, I'm glad you asked. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. He said, I'm just, I want to make sure we're on the same page. He goes back through it again. These are the vows. And the bride says, I do. We will do it. And they say at the end, we will be obedient. That was sweet of them to say that. But we all know that ain't happening. Verse 8. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people. He's like, all right, I made sure. And now I'm going to shower you in blood. So he throws the blood on the people. And it feels, sounds gross. We don't quite understand what's happening. But a couple things are happening here. One is this. Back in Genesis, God makes a covenant with Abraham. It's called the Abrahamic covenant. And he, he cuts animals in half. And then, or Abraham does, and then God makes Abraham fall asleep. And only God walks through the animals as if to say, in this covenant, I'll handle all of it. I'll do both sides. I am the if and the then. It's a promise. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you a family. And this family is going to bring forth the Messiah. This Mosaic covenant is not like that. We noticed it last week. There is an if and a then. If you, then I will. So there's two parts of this covenant. And so there's the blood that goes on the altar symbolizing that God is saying, if I break this covenant, I will shed blood. And then he throws it on the people. And that's the people agreeing to say, well, yeah, we're going to handle our part too. And if we don't, you can do to us what we just did to the oxen. That's what's happening. So now there's this covenant being made and both parties have agreed to it. It's called the blood of the covenant. Now in the New Testament, that would happen again. And by the blood of Jesus, we have been covered. By the blood of that sacrifice, we've been covered. It's been sprinkled on us for the forgiveness of our sin that we might have fellowship with God again. Are we clear? Okay, so that's what's happening here in uh, chapter 24. Verse, uh, 20, verse 8. And he said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words that you've heard and now you have to read. Verse 9. Then Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, Moses' uh, nephews, and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. And there was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone like the very heaven for clearness. Now we read under his feet and we just breeze right past it. Does God have feet? I don't know. But what they see though, they kind of just see, they see the bottom of God and they see what he's on, this firmament of sapphire. Some of your translations say like luzu, luzili or something like that, which is, um, it, it's just not actually sapphire. It's this only rare gem that's only found in this area. It's more brilliant than sapphire, but it's a kind of a bluish translucent kind of gem. Listen, this, it was that beautiful when we saw him, but we only saw his feet. We only saw the bottom of him. Then verse 11, and God did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. It had been told to them, if you come into the presence of God, I'll kill you. Well, now they seem like they're in the presence of God, but God withholds his hand. Why does he withhold his hand? Because they're covered in the blood of the covenant. They're covered. So they've made their way to this place with him. Verse 12, oh, verse 11, let's keep going. And they beheld God, they fixed their eyes on God, and they ate and drank. Now, I read that countless times in the past few weeks and was like, yeah, that sounds right. What? They climb up a mountain, and even that is like they hiked up a mountain. It's not like they just walked up the hill in your backyard. They hiked up a mountain, and then they get there, and they see God. And then God's like, you guys hungry? Let's eat. Which should take you in your mind to John chapter 21, and Peter sees Jesus on the seashore, and Jesus says, hey, it's me. And Peter's like, yeah, it's you. He's like, hey, you got some fish? Let's eat. This is called a covenant meal. The question is, what are they eating? Well, you know what they're eating. They're eating the rest of the oxen that they brought up with them on this journey. And while the people down below have been partaking in this symbolically in the presence of God, the 70 elders of Israel, Aaron and his two sons and Moses get to eat in the presence of God. And maybe you have famous people you want to sit down and eat a meal with. Uh, I can't imagine what this would have been like. And this isn't the way that many of us eat meals now, where you're just throwing chicken nuggets in the back car, in the back of the car. Eat it before we get there. Hurry up. Wipe your face. That's not what this is. 
This is the meal you actually enjoy to eat. Have you had moments like that? Maybe in your stage of life, it's like mine. It's really hard to enjoy a meal right now because somebody always has their mouth open. Somebody always has an elbow on the table. Somebody always doesn't like what mama made. Is that? But this is, they just get to sit and they just get to be with God. But it's peace. It's the peace offering, the covenant meal. In the very same way, when you go to a wedding and the I do's have been done, what follows is the rehearsal dinner. Or not, I'm sorry, the reception. And you get to have a meal with the bride and the groom. It's, it's covenanting that, uh, that agreement, that covenant that has just been made together. This is what's happened here. Now they're at the reception. But not all the guests were invited, just them. And so they're there um, having this meal together with the Lord. Again, it's not fast food. This has all been intentional from when Moses woke up early in the morning to prepare for this meal. And then this happens in verse number 12. The Lord said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain. He just says to Moses and wait there or rest there. Come to me. It's time. Come further in. Come up to me on the mountain. And I need you to wait. And man, we love that, don't we? Gosh, I love to wait. It's my favorite thing just to wait, especially for things I'm excited for. Hey, come up to me on the mountain. I want you to meet with me. Just get up there and wait. There's some magazines. You can read those. They're 10 years old, but I think you should still enjoy them so you can read them. Wait there, he says, that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instructions. And I saying, come and meet with me. And when you meet with me, you're going to get my word. You're going to get it. So come up here and wait. Verse 13, so Moses rose with his assistant Joshua. We met Joshua before. He's kind of the second in charge. He's the one who's leading the military. Come up. And so Joshua goes up, but Moses then goes up into the mountain of God. And he said to the elders, wait for us here until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. We've met them. They held up Moses' arms. Now, if you know the rest of the story, this, these are not the best babysitters to leave your kids with. Like if you know what happens when Moses comes down from the mountain, and there's a golden calf that Aaron and Hur help build. What's happening here? Moses is like, oh, you can trust Aaron and Hur. They're great. I, I would not. Let's get some background checks and then decide whether or not to leave. But he says, you're going to have people with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. You got that handled. I'm going to God. Then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord, the manifest presence of the Lord, dwelt, rested on, settled on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. So let's just make sure we're reading this right. God invites Moses up. He hikes up the mountain. And then God says, hey, come up here further in and then just wait, and then I'll call you in. So when I hear wait, I'm thinking, I don't know, 20 minutes, 30 minutes? God's like, I'm going to give it a week or so. Let's just do that. And so, again, it takes us back to this. How, how do you want your pot roast? You want it quick or you want it marinated? You want it to take some time so you actually enjoy what's being cooked. How do you want your brisket? Well, you want it, you want it marinated, and then you want it in the smoker for a day or so. That, that's what you want. So Moses has been invited to the presence of God, but he's going to have to wait. He's going to have to rest. He's going to have to sit there for a week. Now, if we're being honest, how long would you last? If God said, I've, I'm going to make myself known to you, I'm going to give you my presence, how long would you last? Here's my guess. Many of us left here last Sunday and forgot what we studied and forgot what we worshipped and who we worshipped by Wednesday. So my guess is we wouldn't last more than two or three days before we were like, it's, I must have done something wrong He's taking too long. Let me figure out another way to get to where I'm going. It's going to take some time. On the seventh day, which is, that's uh, crucially important for us, God calls Moses up out of the midst of the cloud, and the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring or a consuming fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people. Moses is inside, and all the people see is this consuming fire. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. Now, I read that in studying. I'm like, golly, that is a long time. And God's like, have you heard of heaven? Because if you think that's a long time, you're going to hate the eternity you're going to be with me. Then I had to take a step back. Okay. All right. What I want is to be in the presence of God. And then I feel like, yeah, well, that's, I mean, that's really long. I got things to do. Have you felt that way? I mean, I want it. 
But then when it comes time to it, I got to get some stuff done. Like I'll come here and worship, but if he goes longer than 45 minutes, I'm out because I got things to do. I got lunch plans. And God brings Moses up for 40 days and 40 nights. How long this took for them to be up there. So again, there's a few things that jump out to me. There's the idea that Moses woke up early in the morning. Moses has the uh, oxen prepared. Moses travels up the mountain. Moses waits, and then he waits some more and waits some more and waits some more. And finally, a week later, he goes into the presence of God. And then it's 40 days that God and Moses are together. God said, I'm gonna give you the tablet. Like, God, could it, can you just give it to me on the first day? Do I need to be here for 40 days? And he does. He's there for 40 days. So here's what's been convicting and challenging to me this, morning, this week as I've been studying. Do I really want to be in the presence of God or do I not? Do I want God or do I just want what he has to give me? Do I really want to sit with the creator of the universe or do I just want him to come fix the situation or heal a friend? What do I actually want? And then I'm guilty of feeling like, well, God, you're so far from me. Why haven't you? And where's your presence? And God's like, I don't, I don't understand what the problem is. Rich Viotis, in his book called A Deeply Formed Life, which a friend gave to me, he says, isn't this what you yearn for? Speaking of the presence of God and rest, aren't you tired of living at a pace that blurs out beauty and peace or joy? Don't you want to be at home like Moses? The speed we live at does violence against our souls. The inner and outer distractions minimize the capacity for us to see God's presence around and within us. The speed we live at does violence against our souls. I just wonder how much of the world's and our own anxiety and frustration and lack of peace has to do more with the pace at which we live our lives. It's attacking our very souls. And then we take the ways of the world, the rhythms of the world, and we try to get into the presence of God with them. And God's saying, you can't, it's not how this works. You can't microwave me yourself into my presence. It's going to take some time. It's going to take some time early in the morning. It's going to take a journey up a mountain. It's going to take a week or so just to sit and wait on me. And then it's going to take 40 days for me to give you all that I have to give to you. Do you still want my presence? Do you still want it? That's the question that we have to ask. Richard Rohr, who is a Franciscan monk, in his book, Everything Belongs, says this, we cannot attain the presence of God. The problem for us is we think if we press the right buttons, we're going to get the presence of God. If we sing the right songs in the right key at the right time, in the right flow, we'll get into the presence of God. And he says, you can't. We're already totally in the presence of God. What's absent is awareness. The question is not whether or not God is present. God is present. And through the finished work of Jesus, we have access into the Holy of Holies, access into the presence of God. The question is not whether or not God is present with you and with me. The question is whether or not we're aware of him. That's the question. What's absent is our awareness. And he continues, God is maintaining us in existence with every breath we take. As we take another, it means God is with us now and now and now. We have nothing to attain or even learn. We do, however, need to unlearn some things. So if you are desperate for the presence of God, and I'll say it again, you cannot worship God with the world's rhythms. We can't get there that way. We can't get there by pressing buttons and getting the vending machine God that we want. We can't get there formulaically. How do we get into the presence of God? Well, it's a lot like using a crockpot. We just put it in early in the morning and then we see what happens. And we take our time to get there. But we have to unlearn some things. Back in 2006, there was a conference held um, by uh, big power tech names at that time. At that time, the Blackberry had really started to rise in popularity. Anybody have a Blackberry? Do you have a Blackberry? Man, you guys must have been rich because that's awesome that you had them. Uh, Blackberries, uh, flip phones, all that. All that was rising in popularity. Email had begun to really blow up to where now is a primary way people communicated with each other. I think AOL Instant Messenger was on the rise and you could leave the best away messages you wanted to on there. And so they had this big meeting and the concern is what, what have we just started? 
because the concern was people were no longer actually present where they were. Their attention had been consumed by many different places. And so even people at work weren't able to focus on their job because they were waiting for the next ding from the email, the next ding on the BlackBerry, that kind of thing. 2006, 16 years ago, they were like, man, this might be a problem. I would just say 16 years later, it's a problem. Yes, it's a problem. And so they have this conference and they bring a speaker in to speak and she shares just about attention, how when it's divided, what an issue that causes. But a guy named Stephen Levy wrote an article in Newsweek magazine in 2006. And he compares it to this. He says, your world turns into a never ending cocktail party where you're always looking over your virtual shoulder for a better conversation partner. I don't know if you ever sat and talked with somebody or maybe you've been at, maybe you've been at church and you're talking to somebody and you know they don't want to be talking to you. Have you had that moment? And they're looking for somebody else because you aren't the person they want to be talking to. Has that happened for you? Now, some of you, you just keep that person on the line as long as you can. And you don't even know you're doing it. You just keep talking. And they're like, I got to get out of this conversation. And they don't know how to, but they're looking for somebody else. They're looking over your shoulder, looking over their shoulder, constantly distracted. This is what Stephen Levy says. This is what the world is like in the information age. We're always looking for a better conversation partner. And then he says this, the anxiety is contagious. And this has made its way into the church, hasn't it? Because even now, you're looking for a better conversation partner, partner than what's, being, what's happening right now. You want me to hurry up and finish. You got plans, you got places to be, you got other conversations to have, you got people you wanna see. Some middle school boy has a girl he just can't wait to get out of here and go talk with. Like he can't wait for that. To have her sit with you next time, I think it might be easier. But we're always looking for a different conversation partner and it creates an anxiety in us. And it's happened for us with the Lord. Sure, we'll give the Lord 15 minutes in the morning just until we find a better partner later that day. And sure, we'll, we'll have this conversation and read this scripture and do these things just until we actually get onto what we want to get onto, which is our jobs, or which is a spouse or kids or school. So the issue for us, back to Richard Rohr, is not that we're not in the presence of God, it's whether or not we're aware of it. Well, then how do you become aware of the presence of God? What does it take? Well, if we're paying attention to Moses, it takes a long time. It takes more than we're used to giving. So if you were, turn to Psalm chapter one. The book of Psalms is a collection of songs is what it is. But Psalm chapter one is unique in that it's not actually a song. And so when the editors uh, put this book of Psalms together, they put chapter one at the beginning because this is more of an introduction or a how-to. This is, this is what all of this is about. This is what worship is all about in Psalm chapter one. So I wanna walk us through this then we're gonna um, experience something here together. We have become a quantity over quality kind of people, haven't we? Just give me a lot of it and I'll take a lot of it. Uh, the way that we read according to Rich Viotis is that we skim, we speed read and we scroll. That's how we read. We skim to find the headline. We skim to find something in bold letters. We skim to find something highlighted. We skim to find the quotes. We speed read, which is trying to gather as much information as we can as possible, as quickly as we can. And we scroll. Our devices have made us a scrolling people. And you don't even know what you're passing while you're scrolling. You're trying to get to the end of it. That's the kind of people we become. And we become that kind of people in the church as well. It's become the way that we study the Word of God. And that's my fear for us this morning. And let me just say this for us as a church. Our desire as a church is to not be a people who are a mile wide and an inch deep. Who know a little about a lot of things. That's not our desire for us. Our desire for us as, a fo as followers of Jesus is that we would be an inch wide and a mile deep. We may only know a few things, but the things that we know, we know a lot about them. And we know that God loves us and we know the gospel and we know the good news of Jesus and we know what the Bible is and we know what his spirit is and how he speaks to us. We wanna know those things. So when I was growing up and I grew up in church, um, I would go to Sunday school in the morning because I was a good Christian and that's what you do. And so I went to Sunday school in the morning and I would get a message there from my Sunday school teacher. He would give us a little lesson. And then I would go into the service. And from there, the pastor would preach. And if I was paying attention, I would get a second sermon. And then we'd go back on Sunday night and then we'd sing some song, mostly requests that have been requested. And we'd sing those and we'd get a third sermon. So in the, in the course of what's that, eight hours, I've gotten three different sermons. Then I would go back on Wednesday night for a wanna. 
and I would memorize a bunch of verses because that's what you do to get attention. So I would do that. So I'd memorize a bunch of verses. Then I became a middle school and I would go to, I would go to youth group and I would get a fourth message. So in the course of three and a half days, I've heard four different sermons on the Bible. And then I was expected to remember all of it. Anybody else relate to that? How'd that go for you? Which is why for us, here's the desire of my heart in being the teaching pastor here. I don't, I don't want to do that to you and to me. It's why our small groups follow our service. And it's why our small groups use the content of the sermon to have discussion. Because I'd rather you spend two and a half hours straight studying one thing than spend 45 minutes on one thing, another hour on something else. I'd rather you walk away at 1230 having picked apart the Word of God. That's what I would rather happen for us. And on Wednesday nights in the fall and in the spring, we're teaching, how do you study the Bible? How do we do this for better understanding? We want to be an inch wide and a mile deep. It's why we do sermon series through books of the Bible. Because I think that's how God gave us the Bible. He gave it to us in books. He didn't give it to us in topics. He gave us a book. So I want to teach through that. And we're going to take a year to go through Exodus because... I just think it's better for us to sit in it, to marinate. I want, I want crock pot roast beef. I don't want our expression in Henry County, the expression of this church to be microwaved ro- roast beef. That's not what I want. I want this for us. So Psalm chapter one, let's look at this together. It's the first Psalm. It gives an introduction. Verse one, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, or sits in the seat of scoffers. Blessed, this has been a hard word for commentators and scholars to understand in the Hebrew. It's kind of a unique word. Some translate it happy, but happy is fleeting. The idea here, I think most closely related to the word is the idea of fulfillment or being satisfied. Satisfied is the man. Satisfied. And I don't mean like Thanksgiving meal satisfied, where you're satisfied, but you also regret what just happened. I mean satisfied like, man, that was the perfect amount of food. And it all tasted good. Satisfied is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked. We'd agree with that. Nor stands in the way of sinners or walks with sinners. We agree with that. Or sits in the seat of scoffers. We agree with that. But verse two, his delight is in the law of the Lord. What? How do you delight in a law? Well, his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates, meditates day and night. We read meditate. And as good Western Christians, we're like, no, 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 we can't do that. Because that's some new agey stuff, and I don't want that. I don't need to rub Buddha's belly. And plus, I can't even cross my legs like that anymore. So I can't do that. So I'm not meditating. Well, meditation is biblical. Now, Eastern meditation, the idea is that you empty your mind of everything. And some of you, you're halfway there already, so you're, you're, you're on your way. Christian meditation, biblical meditation, is not that you empty your mind, but that you fill your mind with one thing, the Word of God. That's what Christian meditation is that you fill your mind. He meditates day and night on the law of the Lord. Now notice he compares the righteous from the wicked. And he's not speaking of behavior. What separates the righteous from the wicked is that the righteous meditate on the law. The righteous make their pot roast in a crock pot. That's the one thing that separates. This word meditates is interesting because it's also translated other ways in other portions of Scripture. In Isaiah 31, verse 4, <clears throat> Isaiah says, Thus the Lord said to me, As a lion or a young lion growls over his prey, and when a band of shepherds is called out against him, he is not terrified by their shouting or daunted at their noise. This word for meditate in Psalm chapter 1 is the word growl in Isaiah 31, 4. And you're like, this Hebrew language is really jacked up because those two things don't go together at all. Or do they? Those of you who have dogs in your home and you come home from the pet store and because you treat them as if they're one of your children, you're like, oh, daddy's home. And then you give him a gift. You do that. You put them in clothes too and carry them around like Paris Hilton. But God, um, you give him a bone and then the dog gnaws on that bone, right? And no matter how big your dog is and how big the bone is, the goal of that dog is to get that bone and to get all of it. And does your dog not growl when they're gnawing on the bone? Does, doesn't he or she? No matter how big they are, they're growling, they're making some ridiculous noises. And then you walk in and they don't even know you're there. And you get close to grab the bone and they growl even harder. You're like, oh, all right, I'm cool, I'm cool. And so you back up. This is what Isaiah is saying. That's what it's like, the growl. So the meditation is that, that you're growling and gnawing so much on the law, meditating day and night that you don't even recognize when somebody else walks in the room. 
This is what it means. A number of years ago, I don't even know if Meredith and I were married yet, but um, we were serving in a youth ministry. I was teaching high school at the time. And so we're serving as volunteers in youth ministry. And we have dinner with the youth pastor and his wife. And uh, Jeff's a big boy. He's a big old boy. And so we go over and he's like, we're going to have some wings. I'm like, yeah, man, I like, I like me some wings. So we get over there and there's just wings. And uh, Meredith and I are here and Jeff and his wife, Melissa, on, on the other side of the table. And Melissa's not, she's not a big girl. And so she's there. And so we're eating. And I'm like, oh, sweet Melissa. You know, she's going to daintily pick off the meat off the bone. So I go to get a wing and I start hearing these sounds like I've never heard before in my life. I don't know how you feel about sounds about people eating, but gosh, I, it drives me crazy. But we're at somebody's house, so I'm being polite and I'm just keeping my head down. Like, I'm not going to look up. I'm not. So I'm like, Jeff is disgusting. I can't believe this is how he eats. And I look up to see Melissa pull a bone out of her mouth. I mean, not an ounce of meat on it, just pulls it out. And I was like, what just happened? <laughs> and meanwhile, I'm still growing in my manhood, trying to figure out how to eat a wing. So I'm leaving pieces of meat on it. I didn't know any better then. I'm, I'm better now, but I didn't know. And she's like, you're going to eat that? I was like, what? You, what? <laughs> Here's all I'm saying. I think, we should, I think we should meditate on the law of God, the word of God, the way Melissa eats chicken wings. <laughs> There's nothing left on that bone. You know what I'm saying? Like she got all of it off of it. And there were some sounds and there were some growling and gnawing, but she got it all off. I think for many of us, what happens is you come in here on Sunday and you hear the word of God preached to you. And so you get a little bit of the meat and then you just throw that in the trash pile. What I'm saying is there's a whole lot left on that bone. So to meditate on the law of God means that we devour, we, we try to get everything we can off it. Meditation is slowly chewing on God's word until it penetrates your heart. How do you get into the presence of God? The Bible is clear. The presence of God is found through the word of God. That's how we get there. We've got to meditate. So what is this meditating person like? Well, it, uh, the psalmist continues in verse 3. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. It's planted by streams of water. It's always nourished, and it yields its fruit. It produces fruit all the time. No, 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 just in its season. What's happened for us in the church is that we have become uh, like most produce um, companies now. We have greenhouses, and we have ways to manufacture growth. We can make a tree believe it's the winter because we want the winter fruit to sell in our supermarkets. And what the psalmist is saying, somebody planted by a stream of living water, they produce fruit in its season appropriately when it's supposed to be produced. It takes a little time. It looks might look barren for a while, but the fruit is being produced. You cannot manufacture the presence of God. You cannot manufacture the fruit that comes from meditation. You can't. And there are people in my life who I know meditate and chew on the word of God and their fruit looks different. Joel Chandler, our worship pastor, he, gosh, he devours the word of God and his expression is a bit more jumpy and dancey than some of us and it's louder and yelling and that's, that's the fruit in its season. Daryl Sanders loves God and loves the word of God and the way that his fruit is produced in its season is this steady, calm peace that just makes you feel like everything's gonna be okay. This is what it is. It produces fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. And immediately like, whoa, whoa, Creflo Dollar, let's not go there. I don't need all that. This word prospers is probably better translated flourishes. Everything that he does flourishes. Somebody who meditates on the word, everything in their life flourishes. Their marriage, is, their marriage flourishes. Their kids are flourishing. Their work is flourishing. Is it perfect? Are they, are they wealthy? Maybe not, maybe, but they're satisfied. And when we're satisfied, things we're involved in flourish because it's no longer about appeasing us. This is about the work that we're doing. The wicked though, they're not so. The ones who don't meditate, they are like the chaff the wind drives away. It just falls off very easily. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish." So then the question I know you're asking is, how do I do it? Like, it sounds great, but how, how, how do I do it? How do I meditate on the word of God day and night? I've got some volunteers with some papers. They're going to start passing these out. So you guys can go ahead and stand up and pass these out as best as you can. They're passing out papers to you, so go ahead and grab them. And I'm going to walk us through what this is. 
This is an ancient practice. Um, really, the Jews came up with this idea of how to actually meditate on the law, meditate on the Word of God. And we've made it into something that it probably isn't. And so again, we're consumeristic. We want to consume as much as we can, as fast as we can. But the Bible is ancient Jewish meditation literature. It can't be consumed that way. It can only be consumed in the way that you sit down with a meal that you actually enjoy. And there may be more than one course and you actually enjoy the company. So you're going to sit there for a while. This is what it means to have ancient Jewish meditation literature. So the Jews kind of came up with this idea. It's, it's littered throughout the Bible. And then uh, uh, probably in the mid-1500s or so, uh, 1600s, the Anglican Church got a hold of this, and they started to put together something called the Lectio Divina. In a Latin, that just means divine reading. It's how we study. If you are in a D group, whether or not you know it, you are doing this. It's a hear journal for those of us who are doing it. It's very similar to that. But it's a way that we can actually meditate on the law, meditate on the Word of God that has been marinated for us. So there are four stages to the Lectio Divina, four stages of this divine reading. And the truth is many of us are like, four stages? I barely have time for a half a stage. No, you got time right now. We're good. We're going to do it right now together. And my hope is that this gives you a framework of how to do uh, how to do meditation, how to meditate on the Word of God, to be in the presence of God. Again, God might call you on the seventh day, and then it's 40 days and 40 nights from there. So on your page, you'll see it. I have printed off um, Psalm 130. On the left is from the English Standard Version, which is what I teach out of, more of a word-for-word -word translation. And then on the right is more of a paraphrase, kind of a commentary of Psalm 130. And I've taken the verse numbers off because we often get hung up on verse numbers. The authors didn't put verse numbers in. They just wrote. And so here's what we're going to do. This is divine reading. So the first of the four stages is called Lectio, which is to read. So first, here's what I want you to do. I just want you to breathe for a second. Just feel yourself breathing. Let's just quiet our hearts. Breathe in and breathe out. Breathe in and breathe out. Then you can pick either of the two, of the two sides or you can read both. But I just want you to spend the next minute or minute and a half reading these words over and over and over again in silence. We're not going to manufacture anything. Let's just read. So quietly in your seat, read those words over and over and over again. All right, now chances are, chances are something jumped out at you. Something might have caught your attention more than the other words on the page. And that's great. That's what should happen when we read the Word of God, particularly depending on the seasons that we are in. So the next phase in your, on your sheet there is called meditatio, which is, again, the idea of meditating or reflecting. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do. This time it's not, no longer about those uh, six or eight verses on the page. Now what I want you to do is focus in on a line or two or even a word. And then just spend the next 30 to 45 seconds pondering that word. I mean, chew on it. Get all the meat off of that bone. You can write things on the side, write it all over, what, ask questions, dig in. It caught your attention. There's a reason why. So now chew on it.
All right, now we're going to respond to it. Oratio, oral, orally, but not out loud orally. Now we just pray. So what I want you to do is whatever you just read, you're not going to, this is not a time to offer prayer requests about your grandma's cat. This is, we're praying to the Lord. Pray those words to him. Thank him for whatever just happened in your heart. Ask him questions. Pray, speak back to God about what you've just read. Okay, and the final stage is contemplatio or contemplation, but I want to focus on the idea of rest. So we're going to do this physiologically as well, because again, sometimes our bodies need to tell our hearts what to do. So I'm going to ask if you can sit as straightly as you can in your chair. I know it's hard for most of us. And put your feet on the ground, like press your feet into the earth. Press your feet down. If you can reach, my wife wouldn't be able to reach, so someone will have to help her. But if you can press your feet onto the ground. Now, what I want you to feel, again, is that you are present here. This is where you are in the presence of God. You're nowhere else. This is where you are. You have your feet. Your back is is up. Now, if you're comfortable with it, take your hands and lay them palm up on your knees or in front of you somehow. This is a posture of receiving. Okay? And then we're just going to rest in the presence of God. There'll be nothing to do but to rest. Now, listen. Your mind three seconds in will drift to something else. That doesn't mean you're an awful person. It just means you're a human and that's okay. Now the exercise is I've got to, you've got to get back to Jesus, come back to Jesus. So it's continually being aware and drawing ourselves back to Jesus. So for the next 30 to 45 seconds, let's just rest in the presence of God. Nothing needs to be said. He said it through his word. You said it back to him. And now it's that time when you just get to be. So just be with God. God, what a gift it is that you invite broken people like me into your presence. So today, God, I pray that you have um, divinely brought someone into your presence today, that they have sat with you, that you have spoken through your word, and they have spoken back to you, God, and that they can rest, just to rest in being with you. Do you forgive us for the times we've tried to microwave this? Remind us what it is to actually sit and to be still in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. As Brandon comes up, and I'm just going to close out. Again, take that with you. My hope is that you can start to figure this out. So here's what happens for many of us. I start talking to you about reading the Bible more, and you're like, easy for you, buddy. You get paid to do it. I do, and I love it, and I'm thankful for it. But I also say this. um, We spend so much time golfing, it's hard to actually read God's. I'm just kidding. Um, most of my week is not found in study of God's word. I would love it to be. But also, I don't want to be a pastor who tries to, who thinks that your life is just like mine. It isn't. And I've spent time outside of ministry, so I understand some of it. We need a few more things. So I'm going to give you a few clues and hints, maybe for me, of how to implement these things into your life. First is this about time. Time, you can't find it. You have to create it. You're not going to find time. I know we think we will. We won't. Because when we find time, we fill it with something else. You have to create it. Meredith and I, a number of years ago, were talking about this and trying to figure it out, even for her, like with young kids, how do, how do you do this? And so we're sitting there and she says, I think I've learned that I, I have to beat the kids up for me to have time with the Lord. And I looked at her and I was like, what did you just say? She was like, what? I have, to, I have to beat the kids up before I can get into the Word. And I was like, are you, what is happening? And she was like, 
No, no, I, mean, I have to wake up before they wake up. I have to beat them up and, oh my gosh, like that's one way. That might be one way. Well, they're taken care of, so now I can focus on God. So it might mean for some of us, maybe it means you wake up earlier, which I know sounds like a preacher thing for me to say. Oh, it's hard, isn't it? It's hard. So then maybe you got to stay up later, stay up past the kids to do that, to make time for the Lord for this. I want to encourage you in this way, though. I think we all have some time in our days if we make this time into that. You're in the car, aren't you? And sometimes in the car, the temptation is, let me just turn on the radio, turn on talk radio, turn on a podcast. What if you didn't, though? Like, what if during that time you just meditated on a verse? I know there are some of us here today who we don't read. Statistics are by the time a man graduates high school, he will finish one book the rest of his life. Right? So I get it. We're also commanded to read the Word of God, so I don't know what to do there except to to tell you there's a bunch of resources out there. And I'm going to tell you this. You don't have to read it all at once. If you want to read one verse for a year, just do that. And then take that verse, write it on an index card, place it on your mirror, place it um, where the speedometer is because you don't pay attention to that anyway. Just place it there. (laughs) Put it somewhere where you're constantly being brought back where you can meditate. We have to make the time to do it. One verse is a feast. Then the question is, I don't even know where to begin. Let me just, I love you to say this. God often leads me of where to take our church biblically. And not just to take us as an organization. I think it's to take all of us. So you don't know where to start. What's your church doing? Read that. Maybe this week you just need to read Exodus 24. Maybe one verse in Exodus 24. Maybe you just need to do that. Maybe it's Psalm 1. Maybe that's where you need to begin. But if you want the presence of God, you're going to have to sit in it and marinate in it for a bit. Which means we have to make the time to do it. And a person who does that is like a tree planted by streams of flowing water. No more tossing to and fro, no longer being uprooted by the winds of culture. A person who does that, everything they touch flourishes. You want to be like that? Then let's get into the presence of God through his word. If you bow your heads and close your eyes, I'm going to wrap us up. Now where you find yourself today, maybe you're too hurried and busy and the pace of life has done violence on your soul. Well, the good news is that there's a healing for that found through the finished work of Jesus. So you can be healed from that violence. Your soul can be restored. And it might take waking up early, and it might take climbing a mountain, and it might take waiting for a week, then it might take another 40 days. But God is faithful, and he is present. The question is whether or not we're aware of it. Father, thank you for your presence. You've told us you're here, and God, I know there's so many times I've, I've missed it. I'm looking for something that's not true. But would you give us eyes to see you in our churches, in our homes, in nature, in our kids, in our spouse, and in our school. Give us eyes to see your presence. Give us a heart to feel it and to know it with a peace that passes understanding. And give us the courage and boldness to make time to feast upon your word. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. <laughs>